Our reading for tonight comes from the second chapter of Jonah. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. Here ends the reading. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers in Christ. Last week in the first chapter of Jonah, We learned how God called him like any other prophet, but there are some details that are unlike any other prophet. For example, Jonah is being sent to a people who are not Jewish. Moreover, they were enemies of the Jewish people. He was to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and preach a word of repentance, even hope and grace to them. Even though Assyria is the empire that destroyed the northern kingdom, Israel, and scattered its people into the so-called Ten Lost Tribes. So he instead runs the other way by trying to cross the Mediterranean to what is now Spain. But God wasn't going to let it go that easy. A storm comes up, it threatens the lives of everyone on the ship, Jonah included. And after discovering that he is the cause, the other men throw him overboard. We ended last week with God providing a big fish to swallow Jonah up. And it's there in that fish we find Jonah today, spontaneously praying what is essentially a new psalm. Now remember, throughout the Old Testament, the seas represent chaos and death. Many ancient people in that part of the world believed the demons were down in the underworld, as in literally under the ground upon which we walk. And they figured that those seemingly bottomless portions of the sea, like in the Mediterranean, were the passageway down there. The quickest route for demons to come up or for us to find an unexpected death would be on the open seas. Now, that's not the only object that symbolized chaos in the Hebrew Bible. Another is the giant sea creature known as Leviathan. Now, it doesn't say here that the big fish that swallows Jonah up is the same big fish called Leviathan elsewhere, but this does strike me as a little bit on the nose. One symbol of chaos and death within another symbol of chaos and death, and that's where Jonah finds himself after trying to flee from God. This is a near-death experience in every sense. He's nearly died by drowning and or digestion, and he's surrounded at least once, if not twofold, by the forces of chaos and death. He's as near to them as can be. Yet even in this underworld of sorts, facing all but certain death, Jonah cries out to God. Last chapter, he thought he could escape the presence of God if he got far enough away fast enough. But in this near-death moment, this crisis he's in, he has a change of heart. Or at least he's willing to entertain the idea that he was wrong. He now behaves as though God's presence is everywhere and that God might hear him in those chaotic depths. So indeed, he does cry out to God from there, and he describes his situation as any good old Testament prophet would. He describes circumstances both as they are and as he hopes they will be. He was driven away. He fears he'll never see the temple again. Yet he declares that God will hear him, hints that he is loyal to God, and vows to make some sort of sacrifice or repayment. I have to read between the lines a little bit there. I mean, this isn't a style in which we typically pray. This is Jonah declaring what he hopes will happen as though it already has. 
And this thing he's hoping for is a deal between him and God. His prayer is heard because he's loyal. He'll have this arrangement where he, he's vowed some sort of sacrifice after he's delivered. So we might see that as a little coded, maybe a little poetic, but whatever it is, the important piece is that Jonah now has some kind of commitment. And based on what happens next, it seems that's to heed God's call and head to Nineveh like he should have in the first place. The phrasing even has an air of celebration as it's presented as praise for God that when Jonah is back on dry land, he will rejoice for it and do as he is called to do. This harrowing experience turns Jonah's life around metaphorically and literally heading him in a different direction. He recognizes God's presence is everywhere and he's done running away. He will instead run toward the place God has called him. The question for us then is, what are our harrowing experiences? When we're in those difficult times, what do we do? Do we cry out to God? And should we, do we finally find God even in our chaotic depths? Well, it seems pretty straightforward that the situation which most closely mirrors Jonah's in our own life is when some illness or accident or attack makes death seem inevitable and imminent. When waiting for results or just plain old waiting and seeing is all we can do. And there's at least some chance that what comes next in the next one, two, three days is very bad news. That's the sort of situation that has people who would never pray all of a sudden praying. It has people giving some credit, honor, or praise to God if things turn out all right. Even if on any other day they would never acknowledge God much less praise. But what about those of us who recognize God even on good days, even on plain old, ordinary, boring days? Given that what Jonah does in this emergency seems so natural, he doesn't serve much as an example of what to do, but rather as a reminder of what happens. The takeaway in this, the sort of example he might be setting, is something else. First, that those of us who recognize how precious this gift of life really is ought to have that sense of awe and gratitude and praise every day, good or bad, emergency or mundane. And second, that to whatever degree we can, we should not find ourselves in those self-seeking moments that lead to such sorts of crises in the first place. I mean, think of it this way. If he ran, as it seems, out of selfishness and fear and then found himself injured or dead, would that have been worth it? Of course not. Yet if he had lived a life consistent with his call, his purpose, lived for the sake of others, even for the enemies living in Nineveh, then there'd be no room for regret. Being hurt or even dying for something bigger than himself, his purpose, what he was called to, would have made for a life well lived. And so too with us. Run toward what God's calling you to. Run to God when you are in need and recognize God every day. Amen.